Welcome, folks. This is a joint meeting of the House Government Operations Committee and House Corrections and Institutions Committee. It is Thursday, March 31st. Um, we are continuing our conversation of yesterday with uh, the issue of recruitment and retention of our correctional staff, uh, both within our correctional staff as well as our field offices. We heard testimony yesterday from the Vermont State employees folks. Um, and today we're going to hear testimony from uh, the administration, the Department of Corrections. We have the Commissioner of Corrections with us. We also have on Zoom with us, um, I'm trying to see, the Interim Deputy Commissioner, Matt D'Agostino. And we also have uh, the, James the uh, Academy Administrator of the Training Academy for Correctional Officers, uh, James Rice. So with that, we will start with Commissioner Demel, who is with us in person. So Commissioner, please come on I up. Mean, <laughs> let me get a couple out there. How, how hard the question Two or three. <laughs> so, so I think one thing that might be helpful is for us to go around the table, the commissioner is new um, and may not know all of us, and we should go around and introduce ourselves. So I'm Representative Alice Simmons uh, from Springfield and Chair of the Corrections and Institutions Committee. I'm Representative Sarah Copeland Hansis from Bradford, Chair of the Government Operations Committee. Representative Hal Colston from Winooski. Representative Rob LeClaire from Barrytown. Representative Mark Higley from Lowell. Hi, I'm Mike Merwicki from Putney, from deep in the heart of the Southeast Kingdom of Vermont. I'm Samantha LeFay from the town of Orange. I'm Representative Poppy from Guilford. Representative Scott Campbell, St. Johnsbury. Can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> Good sound check. Karen Dolan, Essex Junction. Michael Morgan, Milton, you can hear me. Oh, I can hear you, yeah. <laughs> Marsha Martell, Waterford. Uh, Michelle Boslin, Westminster. Larry Labor, Morgan. Bert Taylor in Colchester. Bob Hooper, Represent Representative Mary Morrissey from Bennington. Peter Anthony, Barry City. John Gannon, Wilmington. And we also have another member of Corrections and Institutions Committee with us on Zoom, uh, Representative uh, Linda Joyce Sullivan from Dorset. <laughs> so Commissioner, welcome. And as I mentioned to you, for us to hear all the way down the table, you're, you're going to need to shout. Yeah, especially over the fan, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, there's something <laughs> running. What is that? Hot, hot water. Oh. oh, it's a coffee pot or something. Yeah. Oh, all right. So that's only for a limited time. <laughs> Command voice. Yeah, right. <laughs> can Joining us right now is Representative Vahoski, and she is from Essex. 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 Yeah. So, Commissioner, welcome, and uh, it's all yours. Great. Well, good morning. Uh, hopefully, y'all can hear me, and, and I'm sure the representative here will keep me honest on that, uh, be poking me or, or kicking my legs. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come before you today to discuss what is, I think, the single most important issue of the department, and that's our staff. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, my name is Nick Demmel. I have been the Commissioner of Corrections for about five months. Uh, and in that time, I've had the opportunity to meet with corrections officers, with uh, probation and parole officers, uh, with educators, uh, many of, of those groups you represented here yesterday, uh, with business office staff, with service providers, with legislators, uh, with outside stakeholders, with our labor partners, uh, and even with the central office to discuss uh, the department we now lead and the direction that we want to take it. Uh, but, but most importantly, to diagnose some of our challenges, uh, strategize on meaningful solutions uh, to address those challenges and then execute that change that I think we all seek in the department that our staff yearns for and that I think you are also interested in uh, as evidenced by this hearing today. 
So last night for my recreational activity, I was able to watch the testimony from yesterday. Uh, and, and I was really heartened. You know, I think you had four of our amazing staff members before you yesterday, and they did just an amazing job. Um, I think they provided you with a fair and accurate and a fairly raw assessment of the department that, that we're all here to discuss. Um, but I also think that they demonstrated a current that runs through all of our staff, even the central office, uh, about the department, that everybody is committed to making it better. Uh, and we want to build towards a department that we can all be proud to serve in. Uh, and so I was pleased to, to hear some of the testimony yesterday. And I think you selected four really excellent representatives of our staff. Um, my predecessor, Jim Baker, set this department on a new and more sustainable course. Uh, and uh, I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, it, was, it was the efforts that he made, uh, the aim of correcting our system and avoiding some of our historical mistakes that, that gives us the foundation which we can now continue to build on. And so I wanted to mention that at the top because I think he does deserve a lot of credit for getting us set for this, this new transition that we're trying to make. In my assessment, there are five key areas that we need to focus on to minimize the staffing short shortages we now face, to build a sustainable and structurally sound department for the future, and to live up to the promises that we make to provide human services to those in our care and custody. Those five areas are pay and benefits, professional development and professionalization, staff wellness and the staff experience, communication and leadership. What's clear to me is that the staffing challenges we face will not be solved with any one solution. But instead, we have to deploy an array of effort targeting these five areas. Taken together, I hope, and, and that's all it is, is a hope, that we can rise the tide and demonstrably change the department's staffing, culture, and our future trajectory. Uh, so if you'll permit me a few minutes, I'd like to discuss a few of the ways the department has reoriented itself to those five key areas. Uh, through conversations that I've had in the field and the facilities, through our town hall meetings, and through direct feedback that I get frequently via phone, text, email, and snail mail, uh, it's loud and clear how important pay, benefits, and retirement are to our staff. These are critical supports that we provide to our team. Those conversations have helped me and, and informed our decision making to extend key provisions of a side letter agreement that we made with our labor partners last year to provide additional support to our staff during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and, and they contributed directly to the administration's negotiation of the contract with the labor union that starts this summer and I think really makes meaningful, impactful, long-term permanent investments in our staff. Uh, and so I think that those two key uh, vehicles have provided really important benefits at an important time uh, as we look to tackle these challenges. Relatedly though, earlier this year, the staff at St. Johnsbury handed me a petition that was signed by the vast majority of our team up there requesting that the department change its shift schedule at, at St. John's Barry from our traditional three eight-hour shifts to our two 12-hour shift model. We've used this model during a staffing emergency due to COVID-19 and staff immediately reported a boost in morale, more predictable schedules and time off with their families, and a strong preference not to return to the three eight-hour shifts that we had traditionally used there. Mm. I support ideas like this because they were staff generated. They were staff supported uh, and they make an impact immediately on the lives of our staff, the morale uh, that we're all trying to improve. Uh, 
It may not work everywhere, and certainly we're not trying to push it everywhere, but it was clear that at St. Johnsbury, staff wanted this, this schedule. And so we responded to deliver that to them, and we're working to uh, explore ways to make that more structurally sound in the long term. Pay, benefits, and the like are a critical component of our ability to recruit and retain staff, uh, but they're not the only aspect of a career that people value. And I think it's really important that we understand that. In addition to pay and benefits, people also want to feel a sense of purpose. They want to know that the organization that they work for is committed to them as a person, and they want to feel that they are part of a team. They want to know that we're committed in them as professionals. So if we expect our staff to spend a career in the Department of Corrections, then we need to provide them with a robust commitment in their career, which leads to our second bucket of professional development. We're gonna do this in a, a variety of ways. We're gonna alter our performance evaluation process to include required professional development conversations where supervisors will be required to discuss with those that they supervise career goals, career plans, and the skills and training that the staff need to continually improve in their careers. For its part, the department will make major investments in these areas to ensure that staff are continually supported and empowered to gain new skills, access the training that we offer, and that they can capitalize on those experiences. We're also gonna create career roadmaps so that our team members can make informed choices about what skills they should seek to achieve their individual goals. If a CO1 wants to become a policy expert at the central office, they should not have to do that alone. The department can give them a menu, a guidebook that will help them move through their career. If a shift supervisor in a facility wants to become a probation officer, the department can provide them on the guidance and access to training to empower them to get to that point. These plans will help to de demonstrate the department's commitment to our staff and to their careers. We're also launching new supervisory development training for our staff supervisors. This training will be delivered to all supervisors because we recognize how important the supervisor position is on the line staff and how wide that impact is. This effort is a culmination of specific requests from staff and from supervisors alike to better prepare supervisors when they take on the unique role of, of that frontline supervisor. <clears throat> and it will certainly help to improve the overall situation for the department. This is this, the first in a series of training structures that we're looking to develop in the months ahead. And this new training paradigm will help have the maximum effect on the department. And it launches a truly, a truly crucial time in our history. <clears throat> It will raise the level of professionalism, the skill, and the quality that we have in our department. <clears throat> Professional development and a true investment in individuals by this team will make uh, the department better for all who are serving within it and those who we are monitoring in our care and custody. Another thing we know, though, is that a job in career uh, corrections is not just a job, but it's a lifestyle. Our team knows this, but the department can do much more to support the wellness of our team and the experience for our staff and the facilities and the field offices. To that end, the department is stepping up its efforts to provide wraparound staff wellness programs so that if our team is willing to make corrections a lifestyle, the department is there to meet them to support their whole lives, not just the period of time they're within our facility or supervising in our communities. We've done this already in a few ways. We launched and supported teams that address key needs of our staff, such as a peer support team, a family support team, and hired clinical psychologists to travel the state and provide support to our staff. We surveyed our facilities to determine what they actually needed to enhance the work environment, not the pizza parties that we've heard about. <laughs> but instead, what they wanted were water coolers, toaster ovens, new and more comfortable chairs, coffee and espresso machines, TVs, a refrigerator, popcorn machines, a grill. <laughs> and we're exploring ways to improve the art, the paint, and other atmospheric needs of the, of the facilities to improve the overall situation for staff in those those places. We also launched what I'm calling the small bucket solutions to make small but impactful changes on the daily lives of staff. We changed our policy on water bottles to enable 
staff to bring in whatever water bottle they wanted. Who <laughs> I, <laughs> be surprised, the little stuff matters. <laughs> But it provides them the opportunity to bring in a wider array of beverages and just improves their level of comfort at their workstation. Uh, we changed our facial hair policy to enable greater freedom among staff to don the facial hair of their choice. We renewed an effort to enable them to wear special teams patches or special awards patches on their uniforms that recognize special service within our system. We expanded the provision of hotel rooms to our staff to prevent sleeping in cars or for those long and dangerous drives after long shifts. We expanded paid travel time for staff who volunteer in the facilities that need support to encourage volunteers. We're gonna to continue to seek other small bucket solutions that chip away at aspects of the work on staff that they find difficult. But as we emerge slowly from the pandemic, we need to stop and recognize that these, these staff, the frontline workers, the first responders who are serving 24 hours a day, seven days a week and every day of the year, have experienced trauma, mental, physical and emotional distress and that COVID has taken a toll on everybody. Vermont was the first state in the US to complete the first phase of the Prison Research Innovation Network Initiative, which you heard a little about yesterday, called the PRINT. One of the most troubling findings out of that research was the data surrounding suicide contemplation, both among staff and the incarcerated population. Nearly one in 10 DOC staff members at Southern State reported contemplating suicide in the year prior to the survey. <clears throat> I wanna respect the integrity of the PRIN process, and I think it has a lot of promise, but we could not wait for that process to address suicide contemplation in our system. So earlier this year, the department established a suicide advisory prevention panel. The panel's goals are to create a shared understanding of the suicide problem set, to prepare recommendations the department can take to educate, mitigate, and prevent suicides and suicide contemplation, and to oversee the implementation of all these recommendations within our system. This panel is comprised two thirds of field and facility staff and one third from the central office, including mental health experts and clinicians. But we also took immediate action to address these problems. We established this working group that I just mentioned, but we also reevaluated our suicide prevention stipend training. We introduced peer support teams into the academy, both before individuals go to the academy, during the academy and after the academy so that they know it is a resource on which they can rely. We formally incorporated self-care into the DOC system. We are prioritizing critical aftercare, critical incident aftercare, I apologize. We did a review of mandatory overtime. We're working to change the schedules and make improvements to scheduling for staff. We're reviewing the disciplinary process to improve and streamline the system. We provided a real mechanism for staff to get feedback directly to me and other senior leaders in the central office. We address staff reluctance to seek assistance, and we're providing supervisor training to identify and intervene in acute stress instances. All of this is going to be packaged together in a holistic wellness program that we hope to roll out for staff. These are just some of the ways that we can invest in our staff as individuals and keep the human aspect in our system. The department is also working diligently to improve our communication. We're doing this through engagement internally and externally and abiding commitment to transparency. My goal is to communicate in a way that's substantive, informative, and responsive to our staff. We've reformatted our town halls with staff, which occur monthly. We increase the frequency of workforce notifications that send information to everybody on our team. And we've increased leadership visits to field and facility offices. With every communication, we are going to explain what we're doing, explain why we're doing it, and then solicit feedback and buy-in so that together, concept we haven't always explored, but together we can move this department forward. One of the most common issues raised to me by line staff during my visits to the facilities was the lack of access to the central office and a belief that leadership does not understand the actual challenges faced by our field facility staff. 
So earlier this year, we launched a staff wellness committee <clears throat> to provide line officers and supervisors in the facilities and field offices with a dedicated forum to meet with me on a monthly basis and to brainstorm solutions, represent staff concerns and ideas, and promote wellness in our system. The committee has begun to break down the barriers and will provide a loud and prominent voice to our line staff. And this is just one part of our effort to empower the workforce, improve communications going both directions, and establish a method for important voices in our department to be heard and feel that their opinions and ideas are valued. It's well understood that organizations that fail often do so for flawed, poor, or non-existent communication. Our staff knows that the department struggles with this. And we just need to call it what it is. So when that's the case, distrust, frustration, disconnection are the result. So I'm working very hard to correct the course on communication and build a better system to ensure that we capture all the voices, that they are heard and respected, and that the best ideas are considered and implemented. To that end, I launched a direct channel of communication for every and any staff member to reach out to me directly. This channel has provided them with a known, safe, and open way to communicate with their leaders. It's been a great success so far, and it has directly resulted in changes to our system and many ideas that are under consideration as we explore how to implement them. So let me end with just a comment on leadership. Leadership is uh, one of the most studied concepts in human history. There are libraries full of tomes extolling observations and advice on leadership. So far be it from this lawyer turned corrections official from a small town in Wisconsin to tell you all about leadership. But what I will say is this, the department needs to spot, assess, and develop talent in our system. We need to cultivate our staff and we need to meet their interests with training, education, and skills so that they can excel. We need to rethink the way that we select our leaders in the system, and we need to focus on key attributes that enable a leader to work through and with others, to take ownership of the area of responsibility, to achieve our mission, to motivate, promote, and protect our team. And this is what the culture change looks like. This is professionalization of the Department of Corrections. This is building towards that future that we all want. And it is imperative that we get this right, and we will need your support to do that. So I believe that these efforts taken together have the promise to meaningfully change the situation in the Department of Corrections. Take a little time, but we're already seeing some of the positive results of these efforts. We're working to improve staff satisfaction and embrace a culture that we can be proud of. So I'd be happy to discuss any of that or any other topic that you'd like to discuss today. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, with you all and for your interest in our team. Thank you, Commissioner. And we can open it up for questions and comments from the members. I do wanna thank you for putting in all the work you've been doing in your short time of being commissioner to really start changing the direction of the department and being responsive to the staffing needs. My question is, what you've just testified to is a breath of fresh air. But how can we ensure that those changes will continue regardless of who's in central office? Are there directives, are there policies that you're going to be, the department will be putting in place so this is a continuum? Or is just this going to be more dependent in terms of who's sitting in your seat? Yeah, it, I think that is a critical <coughs> question, uh, Representative. Uh, we need to create the structure that enables this to continue irrespective of who the individuals are in positions. And that's, that's important as it relates to the commissioner, but it's also important as it relates to superintendents or as it relates to our senior staff. Uh, and it's why I think that the training and professional development and that cultivation of leaders 
who have uh, a belief in, in this paradigm is important. But yes, we're, we're going through a review of all of our policies. You would be shocked to know how many are older than 10 years. So we're starting there. Every policy that's older than 10 years is going to be reviewed this year and either revised, rescinded, or uh, updated so that at least the language is up to the modern standard and, and it's represented as what we want. Uh, so that's one way, is we can, we can institute policies that do that. Um, but I think internally, we needed to create the structures that can enable some of this change to happen. And those structures haven't always existed. Uh, so that's an ongoing effort, uh, but I, I'm completely committed to trying to create uh, the, the structure of the department in a way that isn't reliant on individuals. That has been a problem in the past. So you also mentioned that there would need to be some help from the legislative end. Do you have any idea what that might be in the short term or what it might be in the long term? Well, I think we're going to run out of runway this year. Uh, but I think that there are some, some, I think we need to take a step back to really prioritize how how we look at our legislative agenda in the next year and, and some of the changes that we can seek from you uh, in the next term. Um, you know, uh, uh, the construction of a women's facility and the efforts uh, underway to do that are going to be a sea change as well. And that is one way that we can demonstrate our commitment to those in our care and custody. Uh, but it's also a way that we can demonstrate our commitment to staff. When you give them a work environment that is inviting, it meets their needs, it's easier to go to work every day, even if you do have to work the long hours, the extra overtime. Um, but there, there will certainly be things we'll come asking for uh, it strikes me, though, is interesting that uh, of many of the things that I just talked about with you all, there's not a financial tail to that, or if there is, it's minimal. Uh, and it shows to me that money alone is not the solution to all these problems. Money doesn't change culture. So when we look at ourselves, when we take that moment for self-evaluation and introspection, uh, what's striking to me is, is we, we, it's not that we don't have enough money. It's that we haven't been doing it right. And so that's what we're trying to change. Right. Questions? Um, <clears throat> Senator Copeland Hanses, uh, Representative Coffey. <laughs> we'll go from there. All right. Um, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, as, as it happened yesterday, the, the, the staff people who were here speaking to us happened to all be um, oriented to the, the Southern State Correctional Facility. Um, and I'm glad to hear you bring up the, the issue of culture um, because it, it really sounded like currently in and out of that building, they are, they, they operate as a, as a team. You know, they, they want to step in and mm -hmm. step up for each other and, um, and that seems like a really positive development. But some of the words that we heard during testimony yesterday were really concerning to me. And, and I guess I wanted you to talk a little bit more about culture within each individual facility, which may vary from facility to facility, um, and talk a little bit about how you envision helping shift that culture. Because some of the words that we heard yesterday were difficult, dangerous, relies on nepotism, toxic, abusive work environment. <clears throat> Frankly, it's no wonder that it would be hard to retain and recruit into that kind of a working environment. So how do you envision shifting the culture in each of the facilities, recognizing that they're starting perhaps from very different places? Yeah, so Verona has six facilities and they're geographically dispersed from each other and they each have their own unique attributes. That, that part's true. Um, and they're different sizes, which also has a, has a big impact. But I think that um, what we assess and what we've seen in studies or, or assessments that we've done uh, is that the challenges are fairly universal. Uh, they don't actually uh, relate to one specific facility or another. There are, there are certain aspects that do. Uh, but I think as it relates to staff, 
that's not as, as prevalent. I think the challenges faced by staff in one facility are the challenges faced by staff in another, maybe on different scales and, and things of that nature. Um, what we know is that leadership of a facility is critical. The superintendent position is a critical position in the department. I think, you know, without, I don't mean this pejoratively really in any way, but the two maybe most important jobs in the Department of Corrections are the facility superintendent and the first line supervisor. Those two positions have outsized impact on staff. And so we need to be getting it right on those two positions. Um, so training uh, and professional development of first line supervisors and then selecting leaders, true leaders for, this, for the superintendent positions I think are critical. Some of the other ways that we can get at that though are process improvement. People don't trust the promotion process. They think that it's unfair, that it's nepotism, it's the old boys network, and I've talked about this a lot uh, with our media colleagues. Um, we need to break that immediately. People need to have faith in our ability to promote by merit. Um, and so that is one area that we're working very hard at. Uh, we're starting kind of in reverse, but starting with the CO1 position to standardize that application process so that hiring of that role is universal across the system and meets a standard uh, that we want to see. Uh, and then for training, rolling out the training for the supervisors, I think really gets at that frontline supervisor level. People also don't trust the discipline process uh, and it's not transparent, it's opaque. Uh, discipline appears to be disparate, although I don't think that's actually true. Um, and, and I think that's because of a lack of transparency. Um, and it takes forever, or at least it has. So that is an area we immediately uh, tried to speed up, tried to make more transparent and clear, and try to really have a fair and judicious process that we follow on, on human resources issues. Um, and, and then I think we need to communicate with folks, and we need to be seen there, and we need to hear what they have to say so that we can really get to the root of the problems faced by staff. And, and so we've tried to create as many channels for them to communicate that as possible. Thank you. Uh, Representative Coffey, and then Representative Gannon, then Representative Hooper, and then Representative Colson. So Representative Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. It's it's really great to hear this 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 update and, and with your leadership on, on many of these things. And so and it's and it's interesting to have you back to back with the folks who came in here yesterday who who provided testimony that was that was really compelling. Um, and and they clearly demonstrate their commitment to the work and, and desire to take seriously the, the role that they play um, in the custody and care of of people, Vermonters who are in, our, in DOC's care. So, and I was um, glad to hear you talk about professionalization um, of staff and career pathways and training. And I'm curious to hear you talk about, you know, we in our committee have heard about um, uh, through justice reinvestment and efforts before that, you know, there have been so many efforts to divert people from going into our facilities. And so what the result of that is a uh, smaller number of people being incarcerated, but also a different kind of uh, individual or kinds of individuals who are incarcerated. And, um, and I'm curious to hear what the department is doing in terms of training for uh, staff, because we did hear from um, someone yesterday who's been working in the department for 15 years and, and who is clearly committed to his job, but it didn't, I couldn't hear how training over 15 years has also evolved with the, um, with the folks, and we have heard from the department in the past about trauma-informed uh, training, but I, I'd like to hear you, your fresh, uh, you, with your fresh eyes, what's what's going on in that area? Because we do hear like that it should be like law enforcement. You know, there's a tension between security and what we hear from folks working there is like social work. And I'm just, you know, I think that is part of the culture. That's one of the challenges. Like, because I do, I personally, from the work that we see um, incarcerated folks need. It's both, you need to have a secure facility, you need to have calm and everything. But there are a lot of, as you described, a lot of trauma and there are a lot of needs and that need to be addressed, whether it's through medical care, but also through, whether it's re-entry planning or programming. Um, and it takes a, a different kind of skill set than maybe somebody who 15 years ago, you know, what they, what they, you know, the kinds of folks that they're working with. So I'm curious to hear your thinking and how the department is looking at that and, 
you know, looking forward of how that training can su support our staff. Yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, there is an inherent tension between security and, and some of the provision, you know, I think of it as the provision of services that we provide to, to those in our care and custody. Uh, but I don't think there has to be. Um, I think security is a core competency of any facility officer. Um, it's imperative that we have security, that we maintain order because it creates the space for the provision of services, either having volunteers come in, having the service providers come in, or the educators um, without the security to do that, we wouldn't have the opportunity. But I think that the department has uh, moved in the direction of creating more trauma-informed uh, education and training for staff. We recognize that's a critical part of the practice of corrections. This, you know, we had to steal you probably know, I have to steal from my old background, but we always called it trade craft. Uh, the things that you, at your core, what are you, what are you really good at? What are your secrets? Um, we, there's a trade craft to corrections and, and part of that trade craft has to be trauma informed uh, training and education. It has to be recognizing that a corrections officer in a living unit is not simply there to keep everybody locked in their cells. They're also there to help them through situations, to work with the individuals to get the, the care, the system in place that they need to help them thrive and eventually re-enter the community in a positive situation, to connect them with the right resources within a facility. All of that is critically important. I think we've moved in that direction and we do provide trauma-informed training to officers and, and Director Rice is here and I think can speak with more authority on this than I can, um, but we're good at security. Our growth area is the other part um, and I think that's where we have room to grow and keep focusing and we're, we're discussing today our staff and so we didn't go too far in on the incarcerated population, but if you want to talk about a population who has experienced trauma. Yeah. The incarcerated population, even before COVID, nearly every one of them has experienced trauma in their lives. Uh, and we need to recognize that and, and tend to that. Um, so I don't know if, if Director Rice uh, had any comments about the, the training that we're providing. Um, I think he'd be the best to, to weigh in on that part of your question. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Could you, could you just um, identify yourself for the record, please, James? Yes, uh, my name is James Rice. I'm the uh, Academy Director and the Interim Director of the Professional Development Office. Um, to speak to training specifically, like our trauma-informed training, um, the Commissioner mentioned some systematic efforts that are going on to change how we do business so it's not you know, just person-centered, but we're setting up the appropriate system so things are sustainable, and, and that really runs true in the training world as well. So in addition to having trauma-informed training and bolstering that, we also look at it a little bit differently in regards to uh, being trauma responsive isn't just about one training, it's about a lens that we look through. So one of the processes that we are going through is ensuring that every training we deliver, whether it's um, you know, whether it's about trauma or it's about anything is done through that trauma informed lens. And so that really speaks to what we want to shift with the culture, the language that we use in trainings, um, how, we, how we model that from a training aspect that then gets incorporated into our communications training and spread out through all of the trainings that we do with our staff. So we do have existing um, traumatic stress training. We have the commissioner has really supported us in the training world tremendously. Within the next uh, two months, we are taking on a, an entire new curriculum based around uh, traumatic stress management. And it's a, it's a curriculum that's well recognized and supported. It gives staff the tools to um, not only be educated about what trauma is and how it affects them and the stress, but also gives them a lot of wellness tools that they can incorporate in their, their own life. That's something that'll be rolled out uh, in phases across the whole department. Additionally, later this summer, we've been um, giving, given the opportunity to expand our training academy for new staff for an additional week. 
And within that additional week, that gives us more capacity to deliver the types of trainings that are being identified by our staff and the various committees that have been talked about as things that uh, staff really feel are important. And we support that as well. So whether it's increased you know, traumatic stress management training, gender responsive training, all the things that you know, we believe will help us get to the point that uh, we're looking to. So if I might, Madam Chair, um, ask a follow-up question. So, you know, we heard yesterday how um, important it is uh, on, uh, you know, training in a facility, or, and, and we heard how that can shape an officer's, um, you know, approach to the work. Um, so I'm really curious, though, like, how do you work with folks who have been there for a while? I think what's behind my question you talk, we're talking about changing a, you're talking about changing a culture that is a you know positive place to work and I think um, how do you how do you do you require training for office or for people who've been there a while for this new work that's more than like a two hour training or how, how do you really this is about um, culture change really yeah. is what we're talking about and I understand that the academy and I understand that's a rich place to kind of get people um, on firm footing and, and, but what do you do with folks, you know, to help folks who have been there a while, but the, the things have changed, mm -hmm. you know, and we heard, we heard yesterday, you know, change is hard and yeah. in, in, especially in an institution like correction. So how do you see affecting that change and, and bringing folks who have given good service, but bringing them along so that they can continue to be successful and to, to embrace this um, and strengthen their toolkit in this area of work? Yeah, I think that there's there's a formal way and an informal way to do that. So the department does have continuing training requirements and uh, staff have 40 hours of paid time per year that they can dedicate to, to training. What we need to do is make sure that that training is in alignment with these values that we're talking about. And I think that it is, and, and Director Rice is doing a wonderful job of reorienting the training where it needed it and really bolstering the, the good training that we had in place. So, so making sure when officers do go to their annual training that the training they take, regardless of what it is, meets all of these needs. Um, and then, you know, I think almost as important or perhaps more important is the informal piece of that. And that's the on the job training, the day-to-day -day experience, the, the field training officers who are training the, the newer officers, the shift supervisors, the superintendents. We need to get those key leadership positions in alignment with these values and having them do it on a daily basis in the standard daily practice, uh, because if it doesn't take root there, we can train people all day and night and it'll take a very long time to move the ship that way. Um, and I think one of the ways we've done that at the superintendent level, so our kind of six leaders uh, on the top and then at the, the field office managers who are the superintendent equivalent but for the probation parole offices is to start doing much more frequent crossover meetings where we bring all those leaders together and we sit down and talk about them. It gives me an opportunity to talk about my commander's intent, gives them an opportunity to ask questions and raise issues that they're feeling in their facilities. But most importantly, I think it gives us an opportunity to share best practices and try to really understand what's working and what isn't, and then move everybody towards the stuff that's working and away from the stuff that isn't. Um, so that's another venue where we can convey this message and get everybody on the same sheet of music. Thank you. I know we have a couple more questions, but I really want to put in context for members of the committee. How, and you may not have the numbers at your fingertips for today, so I know um, you have some backup folks with Matt D'Agostino and Al Cormier. It would be good for the committee to know how many folks are incarcerated mm -hmm. in our facilities. And of those folks, how many are in the women's facility? Yep. So you may have that at your fingertips today. If not, maybe Matt or Al could. So our, our incarcerated number today is just over 1,300. That's about the number it's been since I've started, you know, plus or minus. It fluctuates a bit because Vermont, as you are well aware, is a unified system. So we have all the detainers in the state as well, which would in, in many states be in county jails or, you know, and they're the population that's very fluid in and out of, uh, depending on when their court hearings are and things of that nature. So about 1,300 um, and it fluctuates a bit. The women's facility, I think this morning was at 88. So uh, less than about, I don't know, 
I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician, Math. but somewhere around seven uh, percent. Yeah, seven or eight percent. Thank you. Yeah. Very it's helpful. A model from a money committee. Uh, Math and public. Right. Right. Exactly. I'm showing my. So we have some more questions, Representative Gannon. No, Commissioner. Thank you very much for testifying today. Um, I, I just have two questions around um, staff shortages yep. and, and overtime. And it would be great to get data okay. for those issues. Uh, because I think every witness that we heard from yesterday testified about the staff shortages and their impact on overtime. Yeah. Um, that it was impacting overtime. I think one witness testified that that impacted their ability to train because you're taking them off the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you only mentioned once um, overtime. You said you're reviewing mandatory overtime. So can you address what you're doing around overtime and yeah. staff shortages, please? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's a very important question. Um, we don't have enough staff across the board. We, we, you know, that, we cannot avoid that reality. Um, it's not unique to the Vermont Department of Corrections, but it is acutely uh, a problem within the Department of Corrections. This existed before COVID, but was made significantly worse as a result of COVID. Uh, and, and the mandatory overtime is a result of that lack of staffing. Uh, the reality is, and, and I appreciated that nobody said this yesterday, the reality is there is no immediate answer to that. We have increased pay and benefits that are very targeted at recruitment and retention. Uh, and our recruitment efforts are going up, and that's an area we continue to invest in heavily. Um, but without the staff, you know, it, it is hard for us to draw down on the mandatory overtime. And so I just want to be very clear about that so that it's it's known that we're not shying away from it and we understand that, but the state has a less than 3% unemployment rate. There are 40,000 open jobs in the state and 10,000 underemployed uh, Vermonters who may not be looking for jobs. So we're competing in an environment that is, um, it's difficult. And you heard Mr. Groner yesterday, I think, you know, very accurately describe this work is not for everybody. And it is hard work. Working in a facility on the concrete floors with the loud noises in an austere environment, you know, eight, 12, 16 hours a day, that's hard work. And, and so of the job candidates that we are going to attract, it's much smaller than, than what other employers are going to face. I think that our pay and benefits are a great way to attract folks to the careers. But I, I, like I said at the beginning, it is not the only way. That is not the only reason people want a career, go to work. Uh, so what we have to do, in my opinion, is all of these other things I was talking about and, and really spread the field and, and try to get as many lines of effort going as a way to attract folks. We can recruit people all day, but if they come into a system that's broken and they, they don't want to work there, they're just going to leave. So we've got to attack both sides of this problem on the recruitment side and the retention side. The reality is until we get more staff, we won't be able to decrease the amount of overtime. There's no way around that. We can tinker with schedules and things of this nature, and that helps, but it's not a solution. At, at minimum, it's a Band-Aid. Um, so our recruitment efforts are going well, and I think Director Rice could talk about that because he also leads our recruitment efforts, but we've really made a full court press on that. We're increasing our digital advertising. Uh, we're posting jobs on, uh, online job board, you know, indeed things of that nature. We've streamlined the process. We identified a problem with the, the state's HR system that was not allowing candidates to translate between one system to the other. We've eliminated that. We're doing job fairs as they begin to open up now. Um, but I think, you know, some, I can't remember which of you asked Mr. Groner yesterday, but do, would you recommend somebody come work in corrections? Until the answer is yes, it's going to be really hard to keep people. Uh, so we need to make this as an attractive career. And I think that it is. The thing that we hear universally from staff is they like their jobs. They, they are committed to what they are doing. It's that they don't trust the, the leadership of the department. They're not communicated with. They don't feel valued. So those are the areas we need to work on. It's not that they actually don't like what they're doing. They really do. And so if we can fix those other things, we will attract people who want us a career in state service. We will attract the public interest folks, the public service uh, oriented individuals 
like myself and many of the others who, who work in the department really enjoy it. So just follow, do you have the data on that? I mean, are, are staffing shortages going down? Um, is overtime going down? Or yeah, we can provide you the data. Um, I don't think that it'll show you that it's going down. I think we've been holding steady um, lately uh, and our recruitment numbers are going up. So that's positive, um, but recruitment, depending on times of year also fluctuates. And so I don't wanna say it's a direct result of X. I think, you know, we need a longer data, data set to be able to say, yes, this is truly having an impact or, or no, we're just in one of these cycles where recruiting is easier. Um, I think, you know, I, it's a really vexing problem set. And so my goal has just been to do everything we can, things that are even out of uh, you know, out of the norm to try to push this forward and, and be competitive and show people they can have a really valuable career here. Thank you. Senator Cooper, <clears throat> Representative Colson, Representative Campbell, and then Rep. Oh my God, Bohoski. And then we'll go from there. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have several questions if you'll indulge me following up on Representative Gannon's. But first, I want to say that when I first heard that you were hired, having had a lot of experience in state government. I didn't know whether the governor was crazy to hire you or you were crazy to <laughs> position. It might have been a little of both. Could have been. But, you know, quite frankly, staff response has been good to your trying things that haven't been tried before. So uh, hats off. I still wouldn't want to be sitting in your chair. <laughs> um, yesterday we heard from some of the line staff about staffing being a crisis situation and no float, no backup in in one of the facilities that admittedly people like being in. And I know there are facilities that people don't like being in. So from a security perspective, you're basically having people work 16s with minimum staffing levels. They're thinking the inmates are getting the, the word out that uh, there is no backup. What sort of plan do you have in place if there is a security breach? How are you going to protect who's going to come in to help? Sure. I have four questions. You want them all at once? Or? Uh, let's take them one at a time. I have a horrible memory. Okay. Whatever my strengths are, that's not one of them. Uh, I'm a little reticent to go too far into our security response plans. Uh, I will tell you, we have a special response team that deals with you know, violence or, or situations uh, in an emergency setting. We also have agreements with state police and things of that nature. Uh, but, but I'd like to avoid going much deeper into um, the, the security plan. I will say, you know, I've, I've, I've heard that line from staff as well that, you know, they, and, and I'm certain that it's true that the incarcerated know kind of the ebbs and flows of the system and they know when staffing is good and bad and they know when things are going well and when they aren't. And um, it, in many ways, our staff and the incarcerated, you know, coexist with each other and, and you know, they're human beings. And so we, we have intuition and we, we can pick up on these things or you can identify patterns over time. Um, it's something that, that we watch closely, but um, what we've also seen, at least certainly since I've been here, but I think over the last couple of years, is a more symbiotic relationship between the two entities because we've all been experiencing something that, that, that hits universally. Um, and the incarcerated were really helpful to us in getting through COVID-19 that you know, their frustrations, particularly now about the lockdowns, and, and I feel for them and I understand that, um, but throughout people were helpful. They got vaccinated and boosted when we asked. They, they did all the things that they could from their you know, small corner of the world to be able to, to help. Um, and I think we haven't, you know, Mr. Garner said yesterday, the population is less violent. We haven't had, you know, acts of violence and hopefully that continues. Um, and I think to Representative Coffey's point, the more that we can interact also, in addition to being security officers, interact as service providers and, and being helpful to the incarcerated, that relationship continues. I was in Maine on Friday, visit last Friday, visiting the women's detention and reentry facility there. And I will tell you, walking into their detention facility and having been to our facilities here, 
different universe. There are no bars, the, you know, the door, it looks like a, a combination of a college dormitory and a nursing home. The, the doors are wood, they have windows. Uh, you can openly walk into the rec yard when you so choose. Uh, and so there is a way to, I say this because there is a way to run a correction system that is security minded and focused and secure but also where there's a relationship between the staff and the incarcerated that keeps down the violence, that, that minimizes conflict. Um, you know, I was really heartened to hear Mr. Groner yesterday talk about how he is able to walk in and, and the volume comes down and he can just talk to somebody. That's where we win. That, that's where we make the, the Well, that mark. kind of brings up my next trend. Perfect. question because you you talked about training and giving training in the academy is a good thing. I'd, I'd sort of like to know in, in coordination with uh, Representative Gannon's question, what the turnover rate is both now in line staff and in essentially training failures in the academy. Uh, how do you expect to offer the training to people on the line when at this point they can't get away from their jobs, period? Yeah. Let alone get to training. I think, you know, largely our drawback in training, and there has been one, um, was the result of COVID-19. And I know somebody mentioned yesterday that we've, we have a phased approach to reopening our system. Be happy to talk about that. But as we move into those phases that enable more in-person work and, and um, have that space, we also, training is imperative. So we need to get back to training. And, and it's something that I've worked with Director Rice really closely on is making sure we're getting our core competency training out there. We're doing our special teams training. Um, so there are, there are ways, innovative ways within a facility that we can ensure that we can take an officer or a couple of officers offline for a few days or however long they need uh, and keep the system going to make sure we can spread around the amount of training that we need to ensure that, that we can make those criteria. So I, I'm very happy to hear that you took the suggestion in St. Johnsbury for the 212s. Uh, if you pull somebody from the line and you get somebody that calls out, what are you going to do to backfill? Because 212s is 24 hours in two days and you're running up against federal law, I think, in terms of saying, hey, will you stay over again? So we have, uh, well, I'll say the 12 hour shift structure actually frees up staff because you don't need to fill three shifts. You only need to fill two. Um, and so one shift a day disappears. And we can talk through, uh, and again, there are smarter people on this than me, but uh, we can talk through how that works. Um, but in, in the situation at St. Johnsbury, the staffing crisis we were facing initially, which led us to try out the 12 hour shift model, it, it evaporated immediately because we had an extra quantity of staff that we don't otherwise have. Um, at, in, in the other facilities where we have the three eight hour shifts, there is flexibility in the system. Um, and we have continuity of operations plans specifically designed for how to maintain staffing levels. And we had to put those to the test during COVID because particularly during the Omicron phase, because so many staff were being taken out by uh, you know, close contacts or infections themselves that we really did have to put that to the test. And we have stop gaps that we can rely on to ensure the continuity of the system. Uh, we're not in that situation any longer, though. I can show you our daily staff dashboard that tracks daily staff across the system, and we're actually in a much, much better place than we were even a month ago. So we do have the bandwidth to reinvigorate training and push that out. Last question, uh, compound question. Um, I assume you're doing exit interviews. I'd like to know how often retirement comes up as opposed to, or in addition to pay, uh, whether you have asked for and received a market factor adjustment. When you talked about raising pay, I wonder how that happened. Um, the 20 year retirement plan, is the department supporting that in any way? So the department doesn't have impact on the retirement or pension plan. That That is not inside the, the borders of the part of the contract that we- Influence goes up. <laughs> okay. 
And I'd like to know what your turnover rate is overall, as I mentioned before. So the, I think largely that's data that we'll have to provide you after the hearing. Um, exit interviews? I'm sorry? You do exit interviews? We do, yeah. And I think that that's an area that had started before I started, but an area that we need to really lean into. And we've gotten extremely valuable information out of those. Those are a really critical tool that we use to understand. The Thank you very much for answering my questions. And good luck. Thank you very much. Representative Colson and Representative Campbell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, and, and thank you for your leadership. Um, I have a communication question. Uh, we heard loud and clear yesterday that staff shortage uh, has been a chronic mm -hmm. and you know, ongoing challenge. So word of mouth communication is powerful and long lasting. So if a staff person leaves because of negative experiences, it's very likely that person will tell 10 other people um, about their experiences and why they should never work for the department. So what is the communication plan and strategy to mitigate that negative messaging? I think we have to win that one on the merits. We need to create a system that staff don't feel that way. When, you know, some staff, do bad things and they go away. And, and that we can't solve for. They're gonna be disgruntled one way or the other. Um, but the, for the staff who are leaving voluntarily, we need to, I think the only way to change that is to create a system that they, they did like working for and minimize that as much as possible. Because if we're not doing that, we're not solving the underlying issue. Uh, and so that's our goal. Um, but we also, should be communicating. And this is something that staff tell me a lot is that they feel there's no, nobody telling their side of the story. Corrections, press coverage is very negative. It's never a positive news story. Nobody's their cheerleader. Um, and so we are developing a more strategic communications plan to positively message about what the department's doing. I think Vermonters would be truly shocked at some of the amazing work that is done by the Department of Corrections. Our Department of Corrections is far more proactive in the justice system in Vermont than nearly any other correction system in the country. Uh, and those are the messages we need to be telling. We need to be talking about the Mike Groners who can walk into a unit and people calm down because he's a trusted voice and he can work through their problems with them. But we also need to be talking about how we're providing high school education and a high school diploma, not a GED, but a high school diploma to our incarcerated population. We need to be talking about how we're about to roll out community college education to our incarcerated population and our staff. We need to be talking about the re-entry services that are immensely successful and the partnerships we have with our service providers. But what we talk about is somebody got fired or uh, there was a scandal at one of the facilities. And some of that is the nature of the beast. We understand that and won't change that, but we can be better at just flooding the zone with positive communication about the amazing work that people are doing. And that will feed some of that. I'm proud to go to work there and I'm proud to tell my friend that I work in the Department of Corrections. That's where we need to get, um, but, but we've got to win all that on the merits. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative Campbell and Representative Bohoski, Representative Boslin. Okay, thank you. Um, so Commissioner, right behind the staffing crisis, what I feel like I've heard most in, in, in terms of uh, issues with, with uh, staff is the remoteness of the central office yeah. and how disengaged central office is with what's going on in the field. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, you, you mentioned uh, doing monthly meetings with with with, uh, with uh, each each office or each uh, facility, and that sounds like a, a great start. Oh. The gravity search. There goes there goes our redistricting. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the old map, I guess. <laughs> Back to the old map. Um, so I, one question that occurs to me is you, you also mentioned that money isn't. You guys hear me, by the way. Yeah. Um, money isn't isn't uh, isn't the issue so much as the culture we're talking about today, and um, I don't want to talk about money, but I, I do want to know that you're looking at 
streamlining or uh, you're looking for efficiencies in central office to free up money to offer a higher higher pay and benefits and whatever for staff. I, 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 I'd, I'd like to know that the answer to that is yes. Um, so I don't know budgets you are slightly, you know, <laughs> disentangled from each other. Well, but. So that, that's what, but that's a side, a side issue. Uh, I guess the what I what I want to ask uh, as far as uh, central office is plans for integrating, re-knitting central office into into yeah. the work of the facilities and and, and how you can how, what other things that you're doing to to do that to make everybody feel like they're on the same team, yeah. including including you know the central office the, the field staff feeling like central office is, is has their back and it's working in their interest. Yeah. You identify a critical problem. Um, and really, there's three distinct camps, if you will, the central office, the field, and the facilities. And each view themselves as distinct entities. As much as we can break that down, I think it'll be important. And we need to weave, as you said, those together. The central office, though, I mean, I think the field and facilities view themselves as, as siblings, and, and the central office is like an evil, you know, Parents. omnipotent force up on the hill. Um, we need to break that down. The way to do that, I think, is through communication. Just be, people do not feel communicated with. They don't feel that they have any input in the system, that they have don't understand why things are happening to them, that decisions are made in a vacuum without you know, the real doers getting to have their say. And so I talked about some of that in, in my opening remarks. You know, I've created a channel where people can just email me directly and <laughs> Folks are taking advantage of that. <laughs> uh, good, bad, and ugly. Uh, we created a, the Staff Wellness Committee, which is entirely staff run. You have to be a line staff member or lower. I'm sorry, a supervisor level or lower. So, first line supervisor or line staff. They got to select who they wanted to lead that, who, how they wanted to organize themselves, how frequently they wanted to meet. And I told them that I would talk to them on any topic they wanted apart from some of our benefits issues and stuff that, that really we have a separate separate bodies that work on those issues um, to give them a vehicle kind of uncontrolled vehicle to say here's what we want to talk to you about we need this changed or we have some ideas on how to fix this um, we also just need to be there more in person in the flesh walking the units talking to folks all shifts I've tried to visit on Saturdays and Sundays. I've tried to visit uh, off hours. Um, I walked in, you know, this happened a couple of times and it just breaks my heart, but I walk in and a guy's been there for 20 years and says, I've never met a commissioner. I've never seen a commissioner. What, what are we doing? You know, this is easy. You know, you, you should want to go talk to those folks. They, they work for you. They're on the line doing it day in and day out. And this is tough work, as we were just talking about. So all of the senior leaders of the department need to be doing that. That's not just a me problem. Um, and, and getting on the road and, and getting to our six facilities. You know, we're fortunate in Vermont that you can get to any of the, from Waterbury, you can get to any facilities in two and a half hours at the longest. Uh, so we haven't come to you and asked for a helicopter or plane yet, because <laughs> geographically, we don't really need that here. But And we only have six facilities. Um, so And it's important to do that with the field, too. I think a lot of our focus has been on the facilities, rightfully so, over the last couple of years, because that's where we're fighting the war against COVID. Uh, but the field also just puts it on the line and... Um, and they've really helped in the facilities. And so we owe it to them to really be engaged uh, at all levels there too. So I think it's a, a largely a communications problem, but it's also uh, getting them involved in decision-making and explaining, even if, we, if, even if it's a decision that must be made at the central office, it's, you know, requires medical expertise, or what, you know, things that, that folks in the facilities might not have, they still can understand why we're doing it. And that's imp important. Um, and so th that's the way we're going to try to tackle that issue. Um, and I think if people see that the central office does something positive for them, which they have not really felt in a long time, but that we're changing a culture that's making them proud to work there, or making their work life better, some of that might change. We might have a better, uh, <laughs> we might get our approval rating up to like six or seven percent instead of zero. Uh, and so, we're, we're, um, yes. and, and that's the way we're going to do it. Okay. That sounds great. So just, I mean, I guess knowing that you're, that you're really working on getting 
your your staff, central office staff, engaged with 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 the field and the facilities. Yes. Yeah, it just it seems seems like a really really important step. Yeah, so. you know. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb, but I have to say the central office staff in their own right are extraordinarily impressive. And, and I think it's sometimes difficult for us to convey what is being done at the central office because often it's here or it's, um, you know, in meeting rooms at Waterbury or other places, but the, but the complexity of the policy that we have to manage, the complexity of the system that we're trying to manage, the budgetary implications. I mean, we have a 170-ish million dollar budget, almost all from the general fund. That's complicated. And a lot of people want to know every dollar that's spent, you know, so there's really complex work being done there. And, and so I understand why the divide exists, but we really need to get to a point where we think of ourselves, the department, as one team, all working in concert, but we all have our jobs to do and they're different and they won't be the same. Um, we'll get there, at least to an extent. Yep. It'll just take some time. Great, thank you. Representative Bohoski and then Representative Boston. Thank you. I have a couple of questions and one is a bit of a follow up to the question that you just answered. I think communication and transparency are incredibly important, but if all we're ever doing is talking and never taking action, it's not necessarily going to help as much as taking action. So I'm wondering if you're hearing from um, frontline staff at the bargaining table or elsewhere as to things that we can actually do to make changes and improve their job. Yeah, so um, in the opening remarks, I talked about the small bucket solutions and I talked about um, some of the other ways that we were just trying to help along the edges, you know, the hotel rooms, things of that nature. All of those, I don't want to take credit for that. I should have caveated that at the beginning. Every one of those was a staff idea. Individual staff member coming to me and saying, why aren't we doing this? Why can't I carry in a thermos of coffee? Can somebody explain that to me? And so... I then asked somebody else the question, why can't they carry in a thermos of coffee? And it turns out there's no justifiable security reason. It doesn't make any sense, but it's the way we've always done it. Um, so staff, I think, are responding to this and contributing and, and finding out that they can ask any question they want during our town halls. They can reach out directly and propose ideas. Um, and I think it's making a big difference. Um, we met with... Uh, some of the labor management groups earlier this year, and they provided ideas about the uniforms, which we took. Um, all, all of these things are, those are the little ones. Um, and certainly we have our uh, differences of opinion on budget issues sometimes, and, but that's healthy and we'll continue to work on that. Um, but where there's ideas that we can do that makes sense <coughs> and will make a difference, we'll absolutely pursue them all day. One of the, as a bit of a follow-up, one of the concerns we heard yesterday as our wages aren't competitive with the states around us, is yeah. that something that we are looking to change? There's a, a variety of reasons for that. It, I think we look at that issue in a vacuum sometimes. Um, we don't have the population that other states do. Uh, Vermont, just across the board, not just in corrections, pays lower wages than all of our surrounding states. And many of our state just, um, there's constraints on the state system and different states have different levels of certification and things of that nature, training requirements, law enforcement requirements that aren't true of the Department of Corrections in Vermont. So I think it is an interesting data point and one to definitely keep in the conversation, um, but it's not as clean as, well, New York pays more, New Hampshire pays more, why don't we pay more? I will also say, while they do possibly pay more, and, and I don't know exactly what New Hampshire or New York are paying, they have the same, same staffing shortages that we do. They're facing the exact same numbers that we are. This is, the, the shortage of staff and corrections is a nationwide problem faced in every corrections department in the country, and it's pretty universal, irrespective of the pay. Um, not that pay isn't important, I think it, it very much is, and we wanna make sure we get the right pay to compensate the folks for the hard work that they're doing, but it's, it's a little more nuanced than simply New Hampshire pays more, therefore Vermont should pay the same as New Hampshire. It, it, it just doesn't quite work like that. Okay, thank you. So one of the other things we heard yesterday about the culture and environment is that it does not feel welcoming to women staff. Do you have a sense of what this is about and what can be done about it? 
I mean, I have my own personal theories on this. I think it, that's a tragedy that, that, that people feel that way. Um, we did just hire, we, we reinvented and then hired for a senior leadership position for the director of women's services. And, and part of her responsibilities are to improve the situation for female corrections officers, and probation parole officers, and also for the incarcerated population. She's also, as, as many of the HCI members now, spearheading our efforts on construction of the women's facility. Um, it is a male-dominated career field, um, and, and that shouldn't explain what's happening, or at least it shouldn't justify what's happening, but it's an area that I think we really need to focus on, and, and we're currently crafting different names for them, but, but our guiding principles as a department. What are the things we really care about and how, we, how can we measure every activity that we do against those principles? And one of them is diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is critically important it, both for our staff and for the incarcerated population that we think through diverse, inclusive, and equitable uh, lenses while we're crafting policy, while we're supporting staff, whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> I think that's an area for growth for us, but something we, we definitely need to focus on. I'll tell you, um, did you send out the press release yet? So we made a couple of leadership announcements this morning, uh, <laughs> new positions in, uh, in the Department of Corrections, and two of those two of the three key leadership positions are women. Um, and I think it's not because they're women, it's because they're the best person for the job. And we have a lot of that. So uh, I'm excited for that. Um, I'm excited to continue to find ways to make sure that we have equity in our system and that we're inclusive, not just of women, but, but certainly all of the different um, amazing people that, that come into the system. So thinking about your discussion about visiting other facilities, and if you think Maine blew your mind, you should check out Norway. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've heard a lot about Norway. Um, I would personally love to visit that facility. <laughs> so, <laughs> Anytime the state wants to send. The rest of their facilities are open facilities, and they're really focused on education and social engagement. Yeah. And people can come and go as they please, but they choose to stay yep. because they're being provided critical services and supports. And I don't know that we're in a space where we're ready to jump to that, but I do wonder what we are doing to shift and streamline, yes, the culture, yet, but also the buildings and the grounds that people are in to create that kind of re restorative, healthy environment, which in my view would be healthier for our correct officers, healthier for our inmates, healthier for our society, and in the long run, healthier for our economy. Yeah, so the main women's reentry facility is of that model. So there are, there are no locks on the doors. People can roam freely. You can walk the perimeter. There's no fence. Um, the perimeter is, you know, don't walk into the highway, basically. Um, and, and that is the direction Vermont is going as we look to reconfigure what the women's facilities in Vermont look like going forward. Um, for the men, I think it'll take us a little bit longer to get there. Uh, but that means how do we retool the facilities we have. I mean, the newest facility in Vermont is 20 years old. Uh, so that tells you how old the oldest facilities are. Um, and, and these are huge projects and, and they're kind of once in a generation construction projects. Um, and so we need to retool some of those facilities to be more accommodating. And I think they, you know, we've done some of that where we have painted different colors that are more inviting and less stark. Uh, murals have gone up and, and incarcerated folks have painted mural, whole wall murals and things of that nature. Um, but at the end of the day, that's window dressing because the facilities are built the way they're built and there's little we can do to reconstruct them once they're built that way. I think the thing that was most striking to me about both the main women's detention and reentry facilities is how much light they draw in. And it's just more inviting and welcoming. And um, so that's the direction we need to go. That's going to take some time. The women's facility, I think, will be quicker because um, we're already starting that process. Uh, but, but certainly, as we work towards you know, the system we want, those, those infrastructure issues need to be top of mind also, because that would make a huge difference for staff. Yeah. And, and with that comes programming, career training, support, counseling. What, are, what does that look like right now for people 
in the facilities that we have to ensure that they're getting the healing care that they need and, and the skills that they need to thrive in our society. Yeah, so, you know, Vermont has some great Vermont in, uh, Corrections Industries um, and we have some great education programs, but we're gonna take some time this summer um, once, once the legislature is out of session and we have a little more bandwidth to sit down and really baseline our vocational rehabilitation programs, our educational programs, and the new programs that we have coming online. And I think we're gonna do some retooling to make sure that we're actually providing the best skills that will help incarcerated individuals get good jobs in the community when they get out, enhance our uh, partnerships with outside you know, employers, both the state who's desperate for employers, employees rather, but also private employers who have already come to us, HVAC companies saying, we can train, we can come to your facility, train people to be HVAC techs. And then when they come out, we can give them a job. I mean, these types of programs, there's a direct pipeline from the facility to a much more positive reentry situation on the outside. And so we're doing some of that great work already at Chittenden, the women's facility, uh, where we have an amazing culinary program. They get safe serve certifications. Um, and, and we have partnerships with Middlebury College to, to increase the work of uh, women incarcerated individuals over there. Um, but I think that's an area that I'm very excited about. And in this summer, um, we're gonna redesign some of that and we'll be excited to share that with you in January and, and come asking for something. That's great to hear. This is my last follow-up question. All right. um, and this is one of the things I heard from both of the people who testified working on the front lines yesterday is we're not social workers. And so my question is, you know, is there someone that can sit down when any when an incarcerated person needs to be a social worker, to talk through life choices, to talk through career planning, to really on demand sit with someone and, and look at how do you want to leave this, this facility and, and lead a different life? Yeah, so I think we do that in a couple of different ways, and certainly there's there's room for growth there as well. Um, but uh, we do have service providers that provide some of that work. So outside nonprofit groups, uh, volunteer groups, we do have mentorship of formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated folks with, with um, newer incarcerated folks. Uh, and then we have our caseworker staff who do, uh, I think, really yeoman's work trying to help people get ready for reentry, getting them state IDs, which is a huge hitch in uh, getting employment on the outside. Um, just an amazing partnership there between the department and the Department of Motor Vehicles and AOT to make sure that anybody that needs a driver's license can get one. And we'll go and get all their vital records and get it all set for them. Um, and the caseworker sits down and helps them work through that or uh, helps them figure out their transitional housing plan or where they're gonna live, making sure that they have a residence that is supported by the department. Um, so some that is great work that's done within the facilities by our staff. And then we rely heavily on, on service providers, our partners from the nonprofit community to do some of that. When they're on the outside, then we have our community justice centers who can help with a lot of the work on the other side of our fences. Um, and, and many partners in the community do that too. It's a, it's a critical area. Thanks. So I'm going to move this along. Our, the House Corrections and Institutions Committee does have some schedule testimony on something else at 11 o'clock. So we've got three people total, and then that, that then we'll shift to uh, Director Rice. Okay, so my question is kind so of hang on, hang on, Michelle. One thing I want to be clear if you're, we're comparing to other states, our DOC department and folks, I think one thing to keep in mind. Here in Vermont, our Department of Corrections is under the Agency of Human Services. In other states, Corrections is under law enforcement, the Department of Public Safety. So there is a different, it's very, very different. And I think we have to be very cognizant of that, that we have purposely had DOC within the Agency of Human Services because DOC is a re rehabilitative model. So I just want to put that out there for folks. Representative Boslin, then Representative Anthony, and we'll finish up with Representative LeClaire. Okay, so my question is, is somewhat related to what um, Tanya was just asking about. Um, yesterday when we heard the testimony from your uh, different staff members, 
um, it seemed like you had some people that are really dedicated and really believe in the work that they're doing. And yet the one area that I found was really alarming was um, the woman who spoke about working for six months on the mental health unit and how difficult that was and how honestly she never wants to do it again. I mean, at one point she said something like, um, the people there need help beyond what we can do. So my question would be two parts. One, what kind of extra services are provided for people in the mental health unit? Because as I understand it, the people with the most serious <laughs> mental health challenges do go to Springfield. And then secondly, what do you provide for staff to help make them able to meet those needs and also to cope with the own stresses of working in that kind of environment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Springfield does get the, the, the most challenging pop, and I don't mean that in a, a pejorative way, the most challenging population and they present the most um, unique attributes that require attention, support, um, assistance, both our geriatric population, our, our mental health patients, um, and, and then some other folks as well. Um, those are tough living units to work in. Um, and I think, you know, the department itself does provide some mental health uh, work. We have a great mental health team uh, that works on that. And then we have our healthcare provider who's ultimately responsible for the provision of mental health care. Um, we have, for staff, we have um, a clinical psychologist who's available to help um, work through any trauma or, or mental emotional health needs. Um, but we also have our peer support group, which is, um, they're not trained mental health providers, but they're, uh, they are trained in providing support to staff, uh, listening, um, things of that nature. And I think staff have relied very heavily on them. The state more broadly offers um, employee assistance programs with access to outside mental health uh, counseling and assistance um, and things of that nature. Um, but I don't think we've seen a lot of willingness to participate in those programs. And so what the department is doing is trying to understand why is there apprehension to access those programs? And then how do we, if they're not willing to go through the employee assistance program, can we capture those services and provide them a different way that staff would be willing to use? Uh, because we know how important the access to that is. Um, and so those are some of the ways that we're able to support staff who are working in those units um, and, and just across the board because trauma happens everywhere. Um, and, and then through our mental or through our medical provider, we provide the mental health services to the incarcerated. So is there a situation where somebody who's incarcerated at Springfield where their need is acute enough that they're actually transferred to an inpatient facility or under sure. yeah. Because I mean, it sounded like some of the situations she was describing, I was surprised that the people were staying there. One of the challenges I'll say in the, well, at least I've only been here since November, but so the second half of COVID was the availability of mental health care across the state. There was zero availability of mental health beds in our uh, more secure facilities. And so in those instances, the individuals were probably continue to be housed at Southern because there was no other option. Um, available and that's a tragic situation um, but that's where the department has to just be flexible and do the best with what the cards were dealt uh, as the state looks to try to work through additional resources i know as of this week and have been for for several weeks now the availability of access to mental health care is much better than it was you know in, in late january thank you mm -hmm. representative anthony and then representative leclair Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Peter Anthony from Barry City. I, I want to reinforce uh, with a little anecdote uh, at least two of your themes. The uh, love of my life was a major uh, party in overseeing the Vermont State Hospital when it existed. And one of the things that she took great pride in and enjoyed was an unannounced visit on the night shift at 2 a.m. <laughs> And if you can't do it, one of your deputies should yeah. on a rotating basis. So I agree with that. The other uh, sort of category of uh, questions or suggestions goes back to Representative Emmons. What can we do, us legislators? We don't run prisons, you run them. Um, and my answer to that, I think being in a mega agency with all due uh, respect to the choice of Vermont to 
place corrections in a rehabilitative model of a super agency, there's invariably pecking orders within those agencies. And one of the things I think I can do or should do is to make sure when you have a need, whether it's because Springfield cannot help a certain class of, of residents for mental health services, you call up uh, the Department of Mental Health and say, by the way, I need two beds in Berlin. Now, the Department of Mental Health uh, may say, and they have said, thank you, but no thank you. You're not coming. That's, if you will, a representation of a pecking order. And that should be something we can do something about. We legislative folks, we don't run anything, but we can inquire as to why it is there's immobility amongst certain classes. It's also true if you create more internal pathways amongst line staff, that invariably triggers a discussion with the Department of Human Resources in the administration. You may or may not <laughs> have a welcome sign uh, hanging around your neck. We should be able to uh, assist in that logjam. So there are various things I think we could do, but we need to know, and you need to feel free to tell us, which is another problem, by the way, uh, and then we need to act on those suggestions. So lastly, let me just point out uh, that uh, having a, a line of communication and a what if box, <laughs> what if we did X instead of Y, and the box is emptied by you or a deputy, not somebody, you know, five positions removed from Waterbury would be a sign that it matters. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. I think he just laid out some tools, and I think that's what's really important to have this joint meeting of House Corrections and Institutions as well as House Government Operations. House Corrections and Institutions oversees the policy issues of DOC, but Government Operations looks at the operations of state government. So there's a real meshing there. And I hope that what we've heard yesterday and today will really help legislators understand how we need to move forward in both arenas. So thank you. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Good morning. Good morning. Um, a couple observations and one question. One, I, I was pleased to hear that a lot of the folks yesterday um, were acting very positively to the changes that they're seeing. It was very nice to hear that. Um, the second observation is um, a lot of what I heard yesterday, some of the concerns um, are collective bargaining issues. And some of us feel that this body doesn't have any role in that. That's, that's your job in the administrations. But my question is, a lot of what I've heard is uh, a change of philosophy. Is there anything about the physical space? <laughs> touched upon it a little bit, but as far as we have six facilities, should we be looking at consolidating? Um, is there something about the space that is confining and basically a barrier to getting to where we want to go from a philosophical standpoint? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> Vermont has a unique system in many ways. The unified nature of the system, this, the number of people we have is, is quite low uh, compared to any other state or, or many other states. Um, and then we have six facilities. Um, we have many fewer incarcerated individuals per staff member in the living units than most states. Most states staff, living units are much, much larger. And so you have one staff member for a population much larger than Vermont's. Um, I don't, I mean, there are ways to move pieces around the system as it exists now. So we could decide to change, you know, Springfield is no longer the housing area for mental health or geriatric. We can move it to St. Johnsbury if, if we wanted, you know, maybe not, that's not the perfect example, but um, I don't know that there's a need for that right now, but I think it's something that 
considering, you know, are we set up in the best way that we can with the structures or, or resources, staffing, monetary that we have available? Um, I think that's a question we should continue to ask. I think that's maybe a, a second evolution of this philosophy change. Let's get this part right. Now let's look, are we set up properly? And if not, what pieces do we need to move around? And certainly that would be a conversation with the legislature. Um, I don't think we're there quite yet. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. I think this has been very helpful to both committees. We've had a, a view of the boots on the ground as well as the office. And I think this is very helpful and I wanna thank you. Yeah, thank you for I'm here. So we can keep you in the hot seat if you want. Happy to stay. <laughs> I'd like to shift yeah. now to the director for our uh, Correctional Officers Academy, the Training Academy, James Bryce. Um, I know that we also have uh, Matt D'Agostino and Al Cormier who are here as the Deputy Commissioner as well as Chief of Operations but I don't know if they had anything they want to weigh in, but you can check on those two before we finish up our meeting today, but I would like to give time to Director Rice, because I know that there was also some questions yesterday from the committee members about our academy and training. So Director Rice, welcome again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I really don't have a lot to add to uh, the commissioner's statements. Uh, one of the, some of the things that he mentioned in his opening remarks um, clearly lay out um, a shift in philosophy of openness and inclusivity and how we're looking to really bring in our staff to help us guide where we're going with training and professional development and all of the efforts that we're, we're, we're undergoing now. Uh, that includes right down to our recruitment efforts. I know some of the, um, the new changes that uh, we've seen recently that we're still waiting on some of the results, um, like the committees that have been set up. Those are already underway, and we're starting to see some of the, uh, the positive effects. We're seeing things like the commissioner talked about his open channel from staff, from a training and professional development um, lens. We've already seen some benefits for that two days ago. The commissioner received an email with a staff member, a line staff member that presented an idea for a recognition idea um, for staff, something that we hadn't thought of on our own. And within a few days, we now have a, a protocol that we're working on that's gonna allow for a new process. And so I think those open lines of communication that the commissioner talked about really do have a large impact on our, our training and the professional development. And so there's a variety of initiatives that are we're working on that. We've set some benchmarks to get through over the next year, but there really is a, a kind of an all hands on deck approach to uh, doing whatever we can to, to support the training and the development that our staff are, are receiving. Thank you. Are there questions? I know we had quite a few questions yesterday. I know we touched on this a little bit this morning. As well. So are there any follow up questions? Uh, Representative Campbell? Well, this isn't, isn't exactly a question, but you reminded me, Jim, of uh, the, the idea that I think I think Mike uh, Groner suggested yesterday of, of having another rank for for the corrections officers. So it's not a, you reminded me of it. It's not exactly your work, um, but maybe this is for the commissioner as, as you considered. So maybe a CO1, CO2, senior CO, or something like that. Uh, to again provide a sense of a career ladder to frontline staff. Yeah, I heard that from Mike yesterday as well, and I think it's it's an interesting idea. My question, I guess, back would be, what is the function of the position? We shouldn't simply put stripes on somebody's sleeve for the sake of putting stripes out there, unless there's some real value in doing that. But if there's a function that that role could play, uh, I'd be interested to, to discuss it. Um, we are set up a little, well, I think many correction systems are different in this way. So there's, there's a lot of different configurations of rank and titles and, and things of that nature. <laughs> and you know, he used the example of the state police 
Um, and I, you know, I don't know that that's a direct analog because they have totally different functionality. They have different needs. They're spread differently across the state. Um, but I think if there's value in creating another position and, and somehow that, you know, a leadership value or support to staff value, I think it's certainly worth considering. Yeah. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, my answer, Scott, uh, is that that distinction would follow a level of training. And that person would literally move from a training environment to a line staff environment at will. That's my answer to why you would do it and the functionality emphasis that you just articulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think anyway, it's something, something, something that conversation. work on, you know, in, in your free time. <laughs> <laughs> of which I have an abundance. <laughs> Other questions? Other questions? Representative Dolan, then Representative Taylor. Um, thank you so much for all this and, and hearing all the great work you're doing. I think it's helpful for us and it's helping for us to have a better understanding of what's going on, what are the initiatives, and helping us to be cheerleaders for the work and the initiatives as well. And so I'm just trying to think of ways like what can we do with this information? And it sounds like, as you said, the runway is short for this session and that this is good information for us to take into the next biennium. Um, one thing I was looking for some reason it popped into my head. I remember there was a resolution last year um, for correctional officers week. Um, and so I didn't know, and I think that is like the beginning of May. I don't know if there is a plan for that, if there's a way as a legislature we can support initiatives, um, because I am hearing that need to recognize correctional officers yeah. and say like, we value you, we care. And so I think we as a group here are hearing that today. And yeah. I just want to put that out there. If there are ways that we can do that together. Um, so for me, I would be on board. I think that is something, and it actually is Director Rice's a department that would manage that, but I think it is something that is done in your response um, in your email. So maybe uh, Jim can confirm that for us. Yes, that's correct. It's, it's something that we, we do annually, and um, we do have things in, in play already as far as preparing for the corrections officer week. I think it's a great idea, though. We're always talking about you know, what can we do to really recognize our staff and show our appreciation and bring others in? And um, if there are folks here that are, are interested in getting involved, I would be uh, definitely interested in talking more about how we could do that. It's, you know, it's not a tangible thing, but I think one of the things that, that we hope <laughs> that this will do for you all is, you know, we've provided you with kind of our ground truth on the department and our strategy for how we're gonna tackle some of these problems. So when we do come back and, and we do have needs, we'll try to carefully explain how that fits into this. And with your you know, understanding based on our conversation and the questions that you asked, hopefully that'll help, you know, we, we can uh, more clearly articulate why it's such a critical need or how it's fitting into this broader strategy instead of looking at it in a vacuum, which is sometimes what the department has done in the past. Representative Taylor. Um, there was something brought up yesterday uh, regarding training that that uh, I know has been discussed several times. And I'm wondering whether it's still getting any attention. I, I've been to the facility, you might remember, a couple of years ago up there at the, the academy and visited it. And, and it seemed perfectly adequate, uh, aside from the practice cell. But, um, it was asked yesterday that the difference between the kind of facility you have and a new recruit coming to it and seeing the facility as opposed to coming to the academy in Pittsburgh. It's a whole different atmosphere. There's a whole different, um, you get the sense, or I haven't been to the one in Pittsburgh, but I've seen pictures of it and things like this. When you see the facility, I would think as a new corrections officer or as a new police cadet or something, you know you're going to someplace special and you're taking part in something that's that's a, a important but if you go to the facility up there it's more well here's a building here's classrooms it, it works i'm staying in a hotel and and i get good training um but it's not at all the same in terms of atmosphere i'm wondering whether that idea of having the corrections officers trained in pittsburgh is something that's being revisited or needs to be revisited. 
Jim, do you want to? Yes. So those. Are, so we have a good relationship with the police academy in Pittsburgh, and we we uh, we partner with them. We share training where we can. Uh, currently, there isn't a, a conversation about like uh, relocating our training down there. At least not that I've been directly involved with. I know there's been talks about it in the past and studies. Our training is. Um, it's much different than the training that they do receive. Um, one, of the, one of the focuses that we have here at the Corrections Training Academy really is on the training content. So historically, when, when we relocated the training program to this building, um, it, it caused us to, to change how we look at training. So we really try to focus on the content, the training, what are the actual skills we're delivering um, and it forced us as a, as a department to really prepare ourselves to prepare our staff regardless of where we may be delivering that training. So it was an opportunity for us to, to look at training and how we deliver it and what are the actual skills we're trying to deliver. And we're going through that again in, you know, in an effort to increase that training. Um, the building, it is what it is as far as it's not, a, it's not a spectacular building here. We feel it's adequate as far as it meets our needs, but it isn't a, a, um, you know, a, an imposing building that, that has that kind of aura when you, when you go to it like, a, like the campus at Pittsburgh. Um, there are some stark differences in the training that we do, though. Our, our training is uh, it's far less paramilitary. It's a shorter term. We really focus on trying to make our training a welcoming experience for our new staff. Some of the staff that come here, uh, they have worked anywhere from a week to maybe a couple months at their facility before they come here. They are employees and we treat them as, new, as employees. Where, you know, they're corrections officers um, and it's, it's been a philosophy of ours over the last several years to really make efforts to make people feel welcome when they're here and focus on the learning and the skills that they're going to need when they transition back to their facilities. Um, we incorporate bringing the facilities here some so that they're getting uh, some exposure to the, the staff and the leadership at facilities. So while they're here learning, they're keeping contact with their own facilities that they're going back to. But um, given the, the time frame that we have folks and the current philosophy that we just want to support our employees to get what they need, um, that's really what drives us as far as how we design our training. Okay. Uh, one question for the commissioner, a quick one. Um, I noticed when you responded to Representative Coffey's question about uh, training, you said that there were 40 hours that they can do training. You didn't say that they were required. Um, are corrections officers required to do yearly training or is it just made available? Sorry, yeah, that might have been a, a misspeak. So what I was trying to convey is there's a, a, an allotted amount of time that's negotiated into the contract that we pay for them to participate in training. There are core competency trainings and other required trainings that, that occur annually. That they are required to pay? Correct. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Rice. It was very helpful. And I also, we're wrapping up, but I also want to extend any um, words that the interim deputy commissioner, Matt D'Agostino, or chief of operations, Al Cormier, if they have anything that they want to add, or if they just want to stay silent, that's well, that's well too. <laughs> So, um, Dep Interim Deputy Commissioner D'Agostino, uh, any words? Morning, no, I think that my, my colleagues have well covered the, the subject, so nothing more to, to offer, but thank you. And Al Cormier. Morning, Chief of Operations Al Cormier. I have nothing further to add either. I think Commissioner Demo and Director Rice did a great job explaining <laughs> all that we have going on right now. Okay, thank you. Is there a question? Okay. Um, Representative Vahosky. 
I have a question and I don't really know who the right person to ask the question is, but one of the things we heard yesterday is that having sort of contracted in healthcare and services is a different culture than corrections culture. And I'm wondering if there's been any conversation about bringing those services back under the arm of state employment so that it is sort of a universalized set of cultures and values and not conflicting. Yeah, a um, couple of parts to that. We do try, and I think this is particularly true of our healthcare providers, but we do try to think of ourselves as one staff, irrespective of who their ultimate employer is. And most of the healthcare staff, regardless of who the contractor is, stays. So if the contractor leaves, the staff remains, and many of our healthcare staff have been there for 18, 20 years. Um, and so, and we really value them and are glad they're part of the team. There's not an ongoing discussion at the moment about bringing healthcare in particular back into the state system. There's a, a lot of conversation about this nationally, about which model actually works better. Um, and and there, you know, healthcare and corrections is challenging. Um, and so is a state run system function better that, you know, they each have their drawbacks. Um, and we'd be happy to talk about that at some point if that's interesting to you all. Um, but, but there's not an ongoing conversation to bring that back in and make it a public service. Thank you. So we have another question, Representative Taylor. Oh. Um, just, I was, you mentioned the first five things at the beginning, uh -huh. and I would have added a sixth, although you've covered it recently, and that's the facilities in terms of upgrading. Uh, and, and you mentioned CRCF, and I think it's great that you visited the one in May. I've been there myself, and, yeah. it, and it's extremely impressive. And it's good to see the department moving in that direction, which I'm sure they are from everybody I've talked to. Um, and also, you mentioned that this uh, change in the facilities is a once in a generation thing. And I think that's coming up in January when we have this, uh, I don't know, people on the other committee may not know, we have a consulting firm coming in to work with DOC and BGS and plan the corrections facilities for the next 20 years, 10 to 20 years, as well as CRCF. So this is a great opportunity to look at how uh, the policies that you're developing could fit into the kind of structures, actual facilities that we're talking about in the future. With regard to that, there is um, the American Corrections Association does audits and evaluates facilities for their airflow. For you know, they do every three years they do an audit if you belong to that association. We don't, but. And currently, the only facility that people or Vermonters are actually incarcerated in that is certified by that organization is the one in Mississippi. So it would be really good if, as we're working towards changing our facilities, we can get it belong to that organization and have regular certifications. The difference being that mental health facilities are required to do so because they're receiving CMS funding, right. uh, so they have to get audited and certified. But corrections, because it's not receiving those funding, doesn't have a lot of oversight from an independent organization, be it federal or be it a, um, a certifying organization. But it would be really good if in the future we could work towards that model where an outside agency audits our facilities and make suggestions as to how things could be improved, just in terms of the facility, but also in terms of the, the programming within them, which is also part of the full certification process. OK, thank you for the recommendation. So that's some food for thought for us as we move forward. So I'd like to tie this up. Um, I want to thank you, Commissioner. I want to thank you, Deputy Commissioner, Chief of Operations, and the Academy Director or Administrator. Um, and I want to thank the House Government Operations Committee for participating in this. I think it's a joint venture, and I hope it's been very helpful and educational. And the folks on both sides of House GovOps, folks have questions about corrections and policies. Some of the questions that came up with mental health, what are we doing for retention and recruitment? There's some initiatives that we've already been putting in place uh, some were done a few years ago, and some are now still working through our current legislative process, and vice versa. If House Corrections and Institutions Committee members have questions about employment, 
and benefits pay classification that's in the realm of government operations committee so i hope we can engage in some conversations here and <clears throat> how we move forward and i know the session is drawing to an end we have about seven more weeks but we can still do some work mm -hmm. so thank you all it's been and thank bsca coming in yesterday it was very helpful and we've had a very well-rounded conversation, and I think it's been very productive on all ends. I want to thank you all. So we're done for, for this meeting. We can finish up, come off of YouTube and House Corrections and Institutions Committee. Please take a 10-minute break. <laughs>